I'm going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, kind of need to uh, get into it. Um, my name is uh, Richard Welty, and I have one of the more obscure topics, um, but um, hopefully you'll find it somewhat entertaining. Uh, this photograph on the uh, lead-in sheet is uh, turn one at the start of the 1911 Indianapolis 500, just to place some framing about history. This is what it looked like back then. Um, famous quote from an infamous figure, um, auto racing began five minutes after the second car was built, and I think that's really pretty much about true. First thing that we would consider uh, a motor race, uh, 1894, Paris to Rouen. There were things before it that were sort of car races, but most historians agree, agree on this one. Following year, the first one in the Americas, uh, Chicago to Evanston to Chicago on Thanksgiving Day, 1895. And then um, another notable occurrence, um, 1896, a horse track, Narragansett Park in Rhode Island, was used as a motor racing track, and this was actually a conversion that lasted for the history of the track. This is the winning car from the 1895 Times Herald race. It was a Durier. Um, the driver was also the engineer who designed and built the car, Frank Durier, and um, it's a controversial situation because he had fallen out with his brother Charles. Durier won the race and then his brother spent 20 years claiming credit for it. Uh, the Wikipedia page uh, on this race is actually all wrong because whoever wrote it bought into Charles Duryea's fake claims. <laughs> so I promised some history and taxonomy. Um, the original race courses were all road courses. They used public roads. In the early 1950s, they largely moved to closed permanent circuits. There were some horrific accidents in the late 40s and early 50s that caused uh, a move off of public roads. Um, there were also a lot of airport courses in this period because um, after the disaster at Watkins Glen in 1951, it turns out that the uh, commander of the Strategic Air Command, a notorious figure named Curtis LeMay, was a huge racing fan, and when it became clear that races had to move off of public roads, he threw open his bomber bases, and there were three years in which all of the racing was being done, um, mixed in with uh, various bombers of the period. And then finally, there are some specific small road courses for carts, and I'll show an example of that later primarily so that armchair mappers can get a sense of what they're looking at when they're looking at an aerial. Now this is a photograph from Watkins Glen in late 40s, and this gives you an idea of why they moved off of public roads. You see that the crash barrier between the race cars and the crowd is a row of hay bales. That was what we knew about safety in 1948. Now there are oval tracks, um, are typically repurposed horse tracks early on. In the late 1900s, you started to get purpose-built ovals. The grandfather of them all was Brooklyn's in the UK in 1907, and the uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway followed two years later in 1909. There were board tracks in the 1910s and 20s. For people doing historical racetracks, these are really hard because a board track was typically built out of the cheapest lumber available and typically lasted at most 10 years before cars started falling through. So you do not find a lot of historical traces of these. I've got one in Miami, Florida. There also, we'll see very small ovals for carts and midgets, and as a reminder to everyone, oval tracks are not actually oval by the mathematical definition. They just all tend to have mostly turns in the same direction. But that's not even true because Brooklyn's is an oval which has a kink in the opposite direction in one of the straightaways. Yet everyone still calls Brooklyn's an oval. New York City information, I tribute to the fact the conference is here. Everybody knows of the polo grounds as a venue for baseball and football, but there were um, three different oval tracks at Brooklyn's. There was a paved one, there was a dirt one, and um, in 1948 there was briefly a board track that was used on two evenings in 1948. And um, this is a photograph of the board track in the polo grounds. 
And I managed to get this into open historical map so you can see the representation of it there on the right. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And just for arm short chair mappers note, there are some weird ovals you'll find out there. Um, this one is built on the roof of the Fiat Lingot factory in Italy. There's actually the building is a production line and the cars roll off the production line on the top floor and they can drive right out on the oval track for testing. And that one is still there to this day. And I promised in the abstract road uh, tracks that had been converted into the street grid. This is San Francisco. This is called the Ingleside track, a horse track from the late 1890s. In 1903, it was started being used for oval track racing, which lasted into around 1912, and it is now Urbano Drive in the city of San Francisco. So you can go drive this track today, although you probably don't want to do it at speed. Drag strips are also a distinctly different kind of racing. They date from after World War II. They're typically, the links are one eighth mile and a quarter mile. Half mile is rare, but they exist. And a thousand feet is typically what you get when a quarter mile track becomes unsafe due to inadequate shutdown area. A Wikipedia article claims it's the premier length and it's like, well, yeah, right. Once again, I have opted not to get into an argument in Wikipedia. Um, and then also in the southwest, you'll see sand drags at 300 foot length for ATVs. For armchair mappers at aerial imagery, one of the important tells about a drag strip is that in the start box, you will tend to see extremely dense amounts of black rubber where they launch the drag cars followed by uh, mostly ordinary gray pavement. This is how you can tell which end the start box is on. Um, this is actually a Lebanon Valley driveway, the track nearest my house, and um, I have never been to the drag strip there, but normally I sit on that bottom corner, and an important note for anyone who's never been to a clay track before, learn how to hold your hand over your beer during the races to keep the clay dust from getting into it. Then there's some off-roading type stuff that's relevant. Motocross, this is an example of a motocross track. These are generally stable things that you can reasonably map because there's a lot of earth moving involved and they're not going to change it. There's a relatively new sport, rallycross, which I think is not stable enough to map, but I need to do more research. And then there are multi-purpose complexes, and we talk about how tagging is done, that's going to be relevant because you'll typically see combinations of ovals, drag strips, and road courses, and you'll see some complexes that have completely separate facilities, but this is Indianapolis Raceway Park, and you'll see they have an oval, a drag strip, and there's actually a road course buried in there that shares part of the drag strip, so that complicates tagging. You can't just draw a line and write highway equal raceway. Here's another multi-purpose complex, Miller Motorsports Park in Tool, Utah, and you see the big road course below, which actually has four separate distinct configurations. There's an east course, a west course, and two ways of bridging them together, but they also have a motocross track in the upper left-hand corner, and then you see a kart track, a little tiny road course above it. So again, for armchair mappers, there's a scale issue here, is when you're looking at it, you need to say, well, okay, how big is it? <laughs> Makes a difference. So how do we tag? Well, conventionally in OpenStreetMap, uh, highway equals raceway, one way equals yes, is appropriate at times, but not always. Most racetracks do not run in both directions for safety reasons. Guardrail is hard, but some tracks do run in both directions. Um, if you're Tempted to use leisure equals track, don't. That's for horse tracks, dog tracks, and people tracks that don't involve motors. Um, if a track is out of service but traces are visible, then in OSM I recommend using the disused namespace. In other words, just stick disused colon in front of highway equals. That will not render, but then that's okay, and we'll get into why that's okay. There is a relation type proposal that's not technically official, but it's an active use in OpenStreetMap, a relation type circuit. The editors will tend to complain when you use it, but that's okay, go ahead. 
It's valuable in multi-configuration complexes because you can set up a relation for each version of the track. And then um, we could use some elaboration. Um, it assumes that there is one start-finish line and anybody who has been involved in motorsports knows that there are times when the start line and the finish line are not the same or when they move them for various technical and operational reasons. It would be really good also to have a sub-tag circuit equal so that we would have a good way to search using overpass and pick things out. When you're using a circuit relation, you should use forward and backward rolls to handle the direction of ways because once again, one way isn't necessarily going to do the job. And this gives you the option of dividing the road course into segments so that you can actually put traditional turn names on it. Like if I go to Watkins Glen and I start talking to the racers, then everybody knows that turn one is called the 90 and everybody knows that that turn nine on the long course is uh, the uh, off camber because of what it does in the middle of the corner. And so these names are common and well known and it's nice to be able to actually map them. Temporary circuits present a challenge in open street map. They use public roads or airports, and there's not a well-defined way to tag them in OSM, but arguably this is event data that doesn't properly belong in OSM and a separate database is indicated. In open historic map, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just draw the circuit on top of the feature and tag it and move on. Pit lanes. Pit lanes are hot areas, and I tend to recommend that people use highway equals raceway because, you know, they're dangerous places. Uh, and then just make the name pit lane and move on. Um, drag strip return roads, though, are not hot, so I'm recommending uh, using highway service and naming it return road. Paddock space, um, just use the standard tags, uh, driveway, parking, aisle, access permissive, and paddocks usually have a name. So the parking amenity, just make it A paddock or B paddock or whatever. If the boundary of the property is discernible, which is frequently possible, then Leisure Sports Center Sport Motor is a good idea. You can put the name of the facility there, address, and website if you have them. Now, a few words about Open Historical Map, which I lean on heavily. It uses a lightly modified OSM stack, which uh, Tim will be talking about later today. And um, in tagging, you use OSM tags, but with some subtle changes. Do not use the disused tag space. Instead, you just use start date and end date because um, we are working on tools to sort this out. And overpass has been recently installed, which is an awesome query tool, and I'll show you that in a minute. It, OHM is currently somewhat sparsely populated, but it has the potential to be very densely populated. If the public library were to ever import all of that data from New York City into OHM, it would be really dense in lower Manhattan. And one issue that I'll show in some of my examples in a minute, we don't have good mechanisms to make explicit references to OSM objects because, you know, the IDs are, can be ephemeral, so you can't just write in an OSM ID. You don't have good ways of noting that stuff. And now we'll run the examples and we will uh, look at why that's the case. Um, Watkins Glen, they have run four different courses since 1948 and there are four variations on the current course, which is the fourth course. And um, yeah, I know I'm not connected to the internet, but I don't care. Um, this is Okay, it looks like I need to be on the internet for this to work. There we go. This is a leaflet widget I put together to show mechanisms for uh, integrating OHM and OSM data. Um, this is uh, using OSM as a base map. 
although it's also got a layer control for uh, And it's not scaling properly, but basically what this is showing you is a vector representation of the first Watkins Glen Street course from 48 to 51, the interim course from 51 to 53, and then the modern course is here. And it uh, allowed, man. That little widget is off of the side of the screen there, but basically there's a control which allows you to turn them on and off, and it actually extracts start date and end date and puts them in the labeling. And um, there's also a uh, Mapbox satellite option. There it is. Okay, so then we've got St. John's Grand Prix. This is a slightly different case. This is an open historical map, and you see that we've just overlaid the OHM layer on uh, the OSM map, so we can see um, the airport course there, and then we can flip to Mapbox satellite and um, see it overlaid on that and. Uh, Then Beeline Dragway is a defunct drag strip uh, north of Mesa, Arizona. It's an OSM with a disused tag. And uh, there it is, with the, again, with the image overlay. And we can flip it so it's overlaid on Mapbox Satellite. And so that's kind of an example of deployments. Uh, this code that I've written is open sourced. It's available um, in GitHub as an OHM example. Um, it's under a three clause BSD license, so you can pretty much do what you want with it. Um, then another example of something that works well in OpenStreetMap already, um, Palmer Motorsports Park is a brand new racetrack in South Central Mass. And um, this is what happened when I just used highway construction, construction raceway. It drew the course out quite nicely. It no longer looks like that because the track went operational two weeks ago, so now it shows up in the pink. Open tagging issues. Dates of operation are far more complicated than start date and end date. Um, New York State Fairgrounds Oval, one mile, um, 1903 to the present day. It has opened and closed many times. It's an open topic of discussion in an open historical map is how are we going to deal with a lot of this temporal data? because it's just far too complicated for a normal uh, open street map tagging. Um, interactions of surface and dates of operation is interesting. Uh, Pine Bowl Speedway was clay for two years and then paved for two years. Um, we don't have a good way of doing that. Sources of data. Um, I lean heavily on history of America's speedways and on the National Speedway Directory. There's a developing class of books on ghost tracks. A lot of stuff online. A lot of local race historians have started to put up web pages about the tracks they care about. Believe it or not, there are two Facebook groups of interest that have been incredibly valuable. And uh, finally, historical aerials and topo maps. I'm working on getting a lot of this stuff into Paul Norman's uh, GitHub project to uh, represent um, available sources of imagery. Um, can be interesting at times. This is uh, Johnston County Speedway in North Carolina in a topo map that's available on Microsoft Research Maps. Know that they have a standard road dimension that the USGS uses. So I drew it in and then I went to the Bing aerial and you can actually see just barely in the trees where the clay was and it's slightly wider than the USGS, which is not a surprise because racetracks are wider than roads. You need to look at sources the same way any good historian does. You need confirmation. You need to know the difference between primary and secondary sources. A first-hand account written 30 years later is not a primary source. It's a secondary source. People misremember or they uh, had beefs and they're waiting for somebody to die before they start, start telling their side of the story. Sometimes they don't wait for the other guy to die. Um, 
The very first race, Chicago to Evanston in 95, this map is commonly published, but it was made 50 years after the race. It's not a primary source. And um, I have had a lot of trouble getting the real route because this doesn't quite line up with the 1893 Rand McNally map of Chicago. It's an ongoing project. You need to document why things go into OHM. Where did the dates and names come from? Where did you trace the track from and why? And if you had to make a choice, why did you make that choice? That's why we have the projects in the wiki where people can act. I put it out there because I want to document why I was doing what I was doing. So here's some info, my handle in OSM and OHM, my email address, and here is where the code and the test examples for this stuff are. And knowing that not everybody is going to go out and buy the book, um, if you are looking at a track and you want details, you should feel free to uh, email me. And um, I will get these stuff up on uh, SlideShare in the near future. So feel free to uh, go look for it. Questions? Yes? Where do you take it from? I've probably got about 20 or 30 racetracks in North America in place. And I have a website with a directory of racetracks that goes back into the early 2000s. And I'm updating that website at the same time as I put tracks into OSM. I figure that I am going to take me a while to cover the operational racetracks in North America. But then after that, there are 6,000 ghost tracks in North America. So where I go from here is I just keep hacking away at it. It's going to take a while. But I'm in contact also with the people for America's Speedways, and they want to do an update of the book because it was last updated in 2003, and I have volunteered to help. We can make this better. I hate to lose track of where somebody once raced. Anybody else? Okay, everyone. Okay, yes. Um, so for uh, for uh, venues that have been in use or re re recently, or maybe are currently in use, do um, you think there's sort of enough information publicly available to make what, what you think are ideal or sufficient maps, or, or is there even something lacking there? For anything that's pretty recent, um, we're in good shape because the aerial imagery, say from the 80s to date, is pretty good. And um, my National Speedway directory has been published since the late 1970s. And um, I have copies of it from 2000 to 2015, and that's got considerable detail. So for anything from the late 70s on, we can manage pretty well. Um, older than that, I've succeeded in finding a few, but it becomes a, a bit more work. But I have found uh, obscure tracks from 1924 in uh, Indiana um, and actually managed to locate them precisely enough to put them in. Yes? So I realize they're mostly just parking lots, but have you ever seen any activity around autocrossing because that uh, tends to attract a large segment of people, relatively. Well, I think that an autocross directory is a really good idea. It's out of scope for what I'm doing. And then the other issue, of course, is that autocross courses tend to be really ephemeral. You show up, you, you throw the cones down, you race on it for a day, and then you leave. The autocross courses that are going to be well documented are going to tend to be national, divisional, and pro courses because of the way that those are managed. But, you know, my own local region up near Albany, I don't think anybody's recording the courses. <laughs> sure. It's interesting. Sometimes you can see an aerial imagery with parking lots. You'll see the courses that are effectively put up pretty regularly. Yeah, yeah, and um, you also see evidence of configurations when you get some of these tracks and when they're coning things off, a lot of times you'll see a particular variant in the aerial imagery. Okay, I guess everyone's had enough. <laughs> Thank you.